Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon to legal ease. Tonight, uh, we'll be inviting you to participate with us in an open line on a very, very interesting topic, which is the topic of commercial law in everyday transactions. Now, before we actually get to the uh, topic itself and unpacking it, commercial law sounds very, very uh, serious to most people. And most people believe it doesn't form part of their everyday existence, but it does. There's two parts of commercial law. The one part is drafting of contracts, and the other part is actual litigation. And it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, an expert and our guest for this evening, uh, Mobin Musa, who is an attorney practicing in Johannesburg. Assalamu alaikum, Mobin. Wa alaikum salam, shukran, and I'm humbled to be on your show. Thank you for having me tonight. You're absolutely welcome. Now, uh, uh, viewers are once again reminded that our numbers for this open line tonight is 011-086-770-1, or 3, and the number will appear on the screen as well. So we urge you to take advantage of the fact that you have an attorney in the studio who is going to be able to answer your questions more on business law. When we talk of commercial law, we talk more of business, but how, how does this law fit in everyday life? Uh, Mobin, you are a, uh, a graduate of the University of Pretoria. You um, came to your own practice a few years ago, but you've been admitted as an attorney since 2006. And you have a number of very, very impressive clients uh, on your books, uh, Zurich and Abelangeni and other very large corporations, which obviously um, you know, you render the necessary advice. What's what's the core of commercial transact or commercial law? Well, Asha, basically, commercial law includes. It's a very broad concept, but it includes everything that is business related. It could range from your labor law, um, your landlord tenant disputes or issues, the drafting of contracts, vetting of contracts, any sort of transaction focused kind of law that you would uh, require advice on. So basically, uh, we're talking about uh, the laws that uh, uh, that um, govern, let's say, business relationship. Would, would, would that be a more, uh, let's say, a constricted definition of this? So, um, Absolutely. Uh, a lease, a lease between a landlord and a tenant. Absolutely. That would fit into the definition very well. And generally, in, in your line of work, uh, what would be the most important consideration for somebody entering into a particular commercial transaction? Let's say I intend to hire a uh, flat, w w you know, and I'm unrepresented. And uh, usually the lessor or the landlord has an attorney who's drawn up a contract. What advice would you give uh, to me? The first thing I would tell you is that you should be aware of your rights as a tenant you should be also aware of your obligations as a tenant. You should know that, for example, one of your rights is to be given occupation of the premises in a certain condition for a specific purpose, whether it be residential or commercial purposes. Um, every single right in law has a corresponding obligation. You should know that you would have to pay a monthly rental to your landlord on a set date. Um, you, you would also have to peruse the lease agreement very carefully and make sure you understand every single clause that's included in there. If there's something you don't understand, it, you're going to eventually put your signature on a document. It could have a negative effect on you in a, at a later stage. So I would always advise everybody to seek proper legal advice and make sure that they understand everything before they sign any documents. Of course, so what you're saying is that it's quite a complex legal document and you wouldn't advise them to try and understand it on their own. Of course, there, there are laws now that say that you have to have a contract in easily understood English and, and you have to know what your rights are. But not everybody has that ability or let's say that resource to approach an attorney. So what you're saying is, first of all, understand. Absolutely. Really read the contract. Now, let's take a typical lease agreement. 
One of the clauses that are uh, very strange in terms of a lessee's obligations, because you're speaking of rights and obligations. Sure. So his obligation is to return the lease premises in the same condition, fair wear and tear accepted. Yes. Now, you know, in, in, in practical reality, fair wear and tear on a carpet, what do, you know, what does the public understand by that? Well, I mean, if, if you have to examine the concept of fair wear and tear and then apply it to a carpet, it's not, it's not hard to, to imagine what would be reasonable wear and tear on, on a carpet, assuming you took occupation of the premises and the carpet was brand new at the time and you vacate the premises two years later, um, what would be fair wear and tear of a carpet of a period over two years? Uh, that is something um, you don't expect to see the carpet ripped or holes or anything of that sort. Um, so it is actually a question of reasonability that would govern that, that actual aspect. So what the tenant has to ensure is that he doesn't abuse the premises and he reasonably uses it for the for the purpose intended. So Absolutely. if it's a flat then you don't start storing your goods in there because you'll be in breach Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. Okay, now look that that's with respect to um, what we you know your lease agreements that the, what else would would you know what else would the ordinary person encounter on a daily basis uh, in the uh, respect of commercial law? Well, other than lease agreements, I'm assuming that the ordinary person would purchase a motor vehicle, right? for example. And in doing so, um, if a person is purchasing a motor, a motor vehicle via one of the financial institutions, uh, that comes with a number of legalities that he would have to familiarize himself and make sure he understands as well. Mm -hmm. um, if he's not purchasing via one of the financial institutions, then obviously if he's paying cash for his vehicle, um, there are other considerations, for example, if he's buying it footstuts or not. Uh, right. So let's just unpack. What is buying footstuts? When I buy, when, when I read the clause footstuts, wh what's that meant to convey to me? The clause footstuts basically implies that you are buying the vehicle as you see it or as it appears. Um, that the seller is giving you no guarantees of anything over and above what you currently see. So, so if you see a dent on the door, now you know that's a dent on the door. Yes. So it's footstools. Yes. But yeah. now you can't see under the bonnet. I mean, you know, how, how, how do you buy a vehicle footstools? What steps would you take? Would you have a look at the logbook? Would you have a look at the service history of it, the general condition that, the eye, that meets the eye? Yes. But footstools, now let's say there's a, a ring or something uh, burnt out in the engine or the gears doesn't change. Th that you wouldn't reasonably be expected to know. Unless you're a mechanic or you're familiar with motor vehicles and the inner workings of it, it is impossible for the ordinary person to know these things. And if you buy a vehicle with a footstool's clause in your contract and you are assured that it's in perfect working order, but a day later the car breaks down due to some mechanical fault, uh, that would constitute what we in law refer to as either a latent or a patent defect. A latent defect, the, the distinction between the two, a latent defect is something that the ordinary person would know of. A patent defect is something that only an expert would know of. So let's say I was a, a mechanic and yes. I went to buy this car. And I, I mean, it's expected of me to make a reasonable inspection yes. of the vehicle. But should the inspection not go hand in hand with a reasonable inquiry so that the seller has an obligation to say to you, look, this ring is, is not working. I, I mean, he, he draws some obligation. So my point is, can he hide behind the footstuts clause? Can he say, I sold it footstuts, I've got nothing to do with this? Well, in recent, uh, in recent times, we have a new sort of law that has come into place, which is the Consumer Protection Act. Uh, this affects the footstuts clause in a very, very uh, serious way. Yes. Um, most sellers who sell products with either patent or latent defects at some point in time will uh, uh, try to hide behind a footstool's clause. <coughs> but with the Consumer Protection Act, that clause has lost a lot of its um, strength and a lot of its validity in most cases. So the, the CPA, Consumer that, Protection That's correct, yes. Okay, that's interesting. So what you're saying is 
Over and above the normal commercial contract, you have a secondary contract that protects the consumer, and it's called the Consumer Protection Act. Yes. But that there's been a number of challenges to what that act really holds. Yes. Now, let, let's take another scenario. Remember we spoke about the lease agreement. Now, let's say the tenant is in breach of that lease, right? He's not paid you rent for six months. He hasn't paid the levies, the lights, the water. And you as the owner are frustrated. You've seen this mounting bills. What steps can you take uh, to now ensure that the tenant leaves? Well, in a case like that, the tenant would be in breach of the lease agreement. Uh, most lease agreements have a breach clause that cater for the steps to be taken in, in such an event. Um, if the normal course is to send a letter notifying the tenant of his breach and asking him to remedy with his breach within a specific time frame, be it 14 days or 7 days. Um, should the breach not be remedied within that time frame, then the, the, the landlord would be entitled to take legal action by either cancelling the lease agreement and suing for any damages he may have suffered or seeking to enforce a lease agreement or any of the other specific remedies that are available. Okay, Mubin, I'll ask you to just pause there. We have a call on the line. Caller, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum to both of you. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, can you shed some light on the Consumer Protection Act insofar as uh, retailers are concerned? What protection do we as, as retailers have when uh, when somebody invokes clauses of the uh, of the Consumer Protection Act in our daily sales? Well, if I understand you correctly, you're a retailer. You are interacting with the public. And the public says to you, you know, in terms of the Consumer Protection Act, these are my rights, A, B, and C. And you want to know if you should entertain that claim from that customer. Correct. Well, I think the starting point, Mubin, is to familiarize yourself with the Consumer Protection Act. It won't be sufficient to say, I don't know what it provides, because this is an act that has now come in after many, many years. It's a singular act that is responsible for protecting consumer rights. So, for example, in the past, when a consumer bought, um, let's say, a kettle, and it didn't work, uh, the consumer would try and take it back, and the, 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 the manufacturer would say, I mean, the seller would say, look, I don't have a warranty, or it was imported, or whatever the case is, and the consumer was left without protection. Now the law has actually switched that around. It says the consumer has a right to complain, and you, the retailer, or the one you bought it from, or the one who imported it, or the one who, who manufactures it, all of you, or the whole line can be, can be held responsible. So in short, you, the retailer, you, the first in line in, in, in respect of any challenge uh, from the consumer, it's your duty to entertain uh, the, uh, uh, the request by the customer. And if you have a supplier, you're meant to take it back if it's within the warranty period and it hasn't been abused. The normal things apply. Look, I mean, you know, if the kettle was, was, was taken, uh, a domestic kettle was taken to, to provide a stadium full of people with, with tea, I mean, obviously it wasn't meant for that use. It cannot uh, operate efficiently. That's just by way of example. So you, the retailer, cannot say, I do not want to participate in this contract with you because it's too late that the customer, when the customer bought the goods from you, automatically protected by the Consumer Protection Act. In other words, Mubin, if you, if you um, agree with me, you cannot opt out of a law. If there's a law, you cannot say, I'm not bound by that. You know, another example is, there's the Labor Relations Act. You can't say to your staff, I'm not bound by the conditions of the Labor Relations Act. I can hire and fire you at any time. That doesn't work. There's a law and you have to abide by it. Is Absolutely. Right? And it, in both cases, the Consumer Protection Act as well as the Labor Relations Act are both applicable to every citizen. There is nobody who is uh, sort of immune from the applicability of the act. Or so <coughs> ultimately, as a retailer, the act is applicable to you as well as your customers. Thank you, Mubin. We have another caller on the line. Uh, 
Hello, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, just back to the food steward. Uh, I just want to know if I sell a car, a car to somebody, you know the car is smoking, but uh, food steward, and then use it after a week or after a couple of days, use it against me, and use the word the consumer council, go there and say, no, the car is smoking now. But he knows about it, but because of this new law that came in, uh, protect him now from what I just sold him as food steward. Can you reply on that, please? Marvin? That is correct. Um, the law will protect him against the food steward's clause in a case like that. The Consumer Protection Act will come to his aid and his rescue um, simply because of the fact that, that the, like I said earlier, the food stewards clause has lost a lot of its effect and a lot of its uh, validity after the promulgation of the Consumer Protection Act. So do you understand that? The food stewards clause used to be a defense against claims against the seller. Now, you couldn't hide behind the food stewards clause under two circumstances. One, when you knowingly didn't declare to the purchaser or to the user there's something wrong with this. And that, so, so that's uh, a, a latent defect. And two, where the defect is patent, where, where the man saw, look, this is a blue car and it had one yellow door. He can't go and say, uh, look, I, I'm taking you on. If you say, I sold it footstools as is and you had a look. However, as the seller, you cannot hide behind your own fraud or your own misrepresentation, or your own silence. Absolutely. Thank you very much. OK. All right, Mubin, we were um, discussing the, uh, I think, the uh, effect of the CPA, Consumer Protection Act, on the uh, footstools clause. But prior to that, remember we were talking about what steps a landlord could take, uh, bef uh, bef uh, what steps a landlord could take to evict an errant tenant, and I'm talking more in terms of the procedures in terms of the uh, prevention of illegal eviction, otherwise known as PI. But before we come to that point, we have another caller on the line. Go ahead, caller. Hello. Yeah, sorry, thank you so much. Again, on the Consumer Protection Act, can um, what, what protection does a retailer have against a customer who just within seven days changes his mind about the product and says, I, I don't want it anymore. I, I want a refund. He has to have a reason. I mean, you can't just buy a thing and then uh, let's take a diamond ring. I mean, you, you know, you buy a diamond ring, you examine it, you have, you know, you're happy with it, and then you take it, you use it, and seven days later you say, ah, I d I've changed my mind. The CPA doesn't, doesn't allow for changes of mind. Not it, at all. You, you know, like willy-nilly. Uh, Mubin? Yes. The CPA doesn't cater for scenarios like that. You, you have a thing called a, a, a regretful buyer, and he decides seven days later he's not, he wants his money back for whatever reason it might be, or even though there is absolutely nothing wrong with the product which he purchased. The CPA does not cater for such scenarios. The CPA will actually uh, not assist him if he cannot demonstrate some sort of fault or defect in the product itself. So there's no, the there's no protection for buyer's remorse. But if the product has a fault and the retail is able to fix the fault? Well, uh, there, there's three scenarios that the CPA gives us. Yes. Um, well, in, in a case where the, the retailer is able to fix the fault, then in such a case, the, the opportunity will be given to the retailer to actually attempt to fix the fault, if possible. I think what uh, the difference is, can the client demand a replacement as opposed to a repair? Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the client does not have that. In cases where the retailer is able to actually uh, re repair the item, uh, the, the client or the customer won't have the, the choice at, at liberty to, to insist uh, on, on, on a refund um, or a replacement either. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you. So, <coughs> Mabin, we were talking about <coughs> the provisions of the prevention of illegal eviction. So, that really is a topic that covers what steps a lessor must take to try and evict an errant tenant. Yes. So, for, 
First of all, that doesn't apply to commercial transactions, right? Not really. Um, the, the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act is specifically there to cater for residential purposes. So okay, I'll ask you to pause there. We have another caller. Hi, Salaam. Hi, Salaam. Hi, Salaam. Salaam. Um, sh shukran for the op nice opportunity. Uh, very, very nice um, um, a show that you people are, um, you know, helping us with, with, with some general knowledge. Uh, just a quick one. Um, I'm, 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 I've got an incident with this missile with, with a friend of mine, and I'm just, uh, you know, just trying because I'm looking at your your program now, and he was he was dismissed for two offences by a company. You know, he never had any. Um, um, warning or verbal, nothing. He was just, he was dismissed for insubordination and, and gross negligence. Um, so, what could this particular guy do? Or, or, or is there any help for him at, at, from a legal point of view, CCMA, etc.? So, what, 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 just from a base, from, from your point of view, what can be done? Yeah, thank you for the question, Robin. Sure. Um, there are many different avenues open in such a case. The best avenue that the employee may adopt in a case like this is to approach the CCMA for relief. Um, obviously there's a time period he's got to approach the CCMA within a, a specific number of days from the date of his dismissal. Um, okay. Also he may make a complaint um, because the procedural requirements as well as the, uh, the, the, the merits on which he was dismissed are very important. The CCMA, the CCMA will first of all ask whether or not the employer followed the procedure as set down in the labor laws um, for purposes of, of going about a dismissal of an employee. Um, sure. If there's any shortcomings in the employer's procedures, then the dismissal will be deemed unfair and okay. he will have certain options available as the unfairly sure. dismissed employee. Um, some of those options may include either reinstatement or compensation in the form of monetary compensation. Sure, sure. Um, can, can I just inter, inter, interrupt here quick? Uh, just, uh, inter sure. What ahead. happened uh, was, was um, the, the, according to, uh, you know, look, there's obviously two sides to a story. Since I'm just telling you my story, however, as this lady told me, um, that um, she was instructed to do something. Um, by, which was a simple instruction, but it's not a job desc it's not a description. It's because there is managers in, 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 uh, in uh, can I say there's managers that needs to do that function. However, she used to have assist them, but she doesn't get paid for, to do that. And she, she mentioned to the, to, to the manager at, in December that she's no longer going to do it. He agreed upon it. He agreed upon it. And then, uh, um, the second second one, uh, gross negligence, because it's a, it's, a, it's, a clean, it's a cleaning company, um, they, 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 they generally get uh, pro, uh, you know problems with the PCFA. She's an administrator. They, it was an interfax that came through to to to, uh, to a, a laptop. Also, uh, yes, and normally an interact, uh, interactive fax. It's, it's some people that fax staff members that fax uh, the um, the time sheets or the banking people, etc. However, this particular um, fax came oh, through. Oh, okay, sorry was, just to interrupt you, caller. Uh, the details sure. are, are quite lengthy that you're giving us. And I mean, those sure. facts, um, you know, we can't examine the details of it. I think what Mobini is saying is the following. If there's non-compliance with the Labor Relations Act, for example, she was just fired. She was not given a warning. She was not invited to a disciplinary hearing for insubordination. The charges were not put to her. There wasn't a finding. Then that company has clearly defaulted. It has not followed the provisions of the Labor Relations Act. And as Mobin has okay. pointed out, your relief lies with the CCMA in your jurisdiction. You should approach okay. them as soon as possible and lay a complaint and they have trained uh, officers to assist you with laying the complaint. I must just add, you should not be paying anyone there for that service. It's free of charge. Absolutely. For and sure. then they take for it sure. up for you. No, and, and I appreciate it very much. This is a big help. Uh, all the best, man. Thank you very much for this. You're welcome. Thank you. So, Mubin, we were talking about uh, the provisions of prevention of illegal evictions.
Yes. What, what, what do we understand by this particular law? Well, the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act, also a fairly recent act. However, it has um, been fairly tested in our courts, and most of the points that come out of this act are, are quite moot at this stage. Um, the act is there to cater for the people who are elderly and cannot simply be find alternate uh, um, resident accommodation. residential accommodation, not just the elderly, but for the very poor and those who are in situations very similar to those. Um, in the past, what we would have were landlords who would simply evict tenants um, illegally. Well, even though it was legal at the time, it's now become illegal to simply lock your tenant out of the um, premises and that sort of thing. So the act caters for cases like that, and it, it has in put in place a number of procedures that a landlord must follow um, before he can actually evict a tenant from a residential dwelling. Okay. Well, we're going to ask you to pause there. We have another caller. Please go ahead. Uh, can you tell me, a, 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 Muslim, a Muslim heir, what recourse that we have against a non-Muslim attorney who has drawn up a non-Sharia compliant will? As far as I know, nothing, because uh, the, the attorney doesn't draw up the will, the heir doesn't draw up the will, the testator draws up the will, the testator has to decide on the regime and who he employs. The heir can't go back to the person, the scribe, and say, oh, but I'm accusing you of something. I mean, because that's, that's the freedom. We have what we call freedom of testation. The testator can be absolutely ruthless or, you know, uh, generous to whoever he wants and follow whatever regime he wants. So you can't go back to the attorney and say, I, as the heir, object to you having drawn up the will, because it's not his will. Absolutely. In most cases, okay. the, the attorney would just take an instruction and follow it. Exactly. He takes instructions. He doesn't uh, do things on his own. Uh, I, was just, I, was just, I was just thinking with the South African constitution, wouldn't it be possible to say, you should have realized that this is a Muslim uh, uh, estate and Muslim law will apply and in that sense advise your client, would it not be better for you to obtain Sharia advice in drawing up this world? You see, I think you must just remember what Mobin was saying. Attorneys take instructions. They don't give instructions to their clients. They, they, the client comes to them. The client says, this is my wishes, and you reduce that to writing. So there's no liability on the attorney if he doesn't advise him, look, go away and go to another Muslim lawyer. There's no liability there. Or, or duty, for that matter. Oh, yeah. OK, thank you for your call. So I mean, uh, in terms of prevention of illegal evictions, what you are saying is, Previously, landlords uh, resorted to self-help. This, this uh, um, act came in and says, um, this act came in to try and protect the, te the tenants against the landlord self-help. Before we move on to the next point, we have another caller. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello, yes, we can hear you. Yes, sir. I was asking, I have a question of saying, as you are talking here on the TV, what if they are foreign from another country and then they fire you just like that, but you don't have a uh, work permit in your passport? Can you help on that? Yes, absolutely. There's a very old case um, in, uh, in the CCMA and the labor courts. It's a matter yeah. of a discovery, uh, a worker that was uh, on an illegal work permit and yeah. he was fired and he went to the yeah. CCM and the labor court and the labor court and the CCM says our, our laws protect everyone that's in it if you are illegal or you uh, you don't have your papers or whatever the case is that can't be used against you there's a contract yeah. between you and the employer and that the yeah. labor laws relate to that contract it's got nothing to do with status which is whether you are here legally or illegally okay so you can turn to the um, uh, CCMA and um, uh, other parties that are there to assist you. Um, Movin, it's time to take a break now. Um, we will, we'll be going away for a short break, uh, for an ad break, and we'll join you on the other side of the break.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Just before the break, uh, we were talking about um, the uh, provisions of the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act. Now, Mubin, just unpack, what are the duties of a lessor? Well, the duties that are imposed upon him by the new, um, call it the Prevention of Illegal Evictions Act, um, he's got to follow certain procedures before he can evict a tenant in a residential dwelling. These procedures are somewhat complicated for a layperson, um, even for some attorneys, but he's got to actually make an application in terms of Section 42 of the Act to, to allow him to serve a notice on the tenant that is in bridge or that no longer has a right to occupy the premises. Um, this application must be served both on the tenant as well as on the local municipality in which the dwelling is situated. Um, once this application is granted, he then has a right to serve the application in terms of the PI Act, the actual application in th that the tenant may actually object to or respond to and come to court and tell their side of the story, etc. So, uh, before we continue, we have another caller on the line? Yes, uh, Mr. Essop. Yes. How are you, sir? It's Umar Farouk Fania. I'm fine, thanks. Uh, hello, Mubin. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. And yourself? Uh, I was just thinking about the Consumer Protection Act. And I had something to add, if you don't mind. Please go ahead. Uh, so this is about, uh, this is a Muslim show, right? Addressed to the Muslim audience. So I wanted to add something. I was thinking about this while you guys were speaking. And uh, in fact, there was a something that happened with the Sahaba in the Rasul Sallallahu and uh, one man came to one of the Sahabas for a refund and uh, so the Sahaba said okay Bismillah and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi looked at him and he said well the garden is for you so one of the other Sahaba who was sitting with this man he said really is that, is that like that guy's got the garden so the Rasul Sallallahu said yes so this guy waited his whole life he waited, in fact, seven years so that he could give somebody else a refund, you know? I mean, that was the level of the Sahabas. So I know it's not a question or anything. I just wanted to add that, you know, uh, in terms of the Consumer Protection Act. I don't know how you guys feel about it. No, oh, thank you. I think that's very interesting. Uh, I think the underlying uh, 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 ethos or the message there is that they were correcting their everyday transactions. And for that, they got uh, the garden. So I think what you're saying is, even without the Consumer Protection Act, just be correct in your transactions. I think but thank you for the call. I think the Sahaba... Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, the, the Sahaba were a different caliber of people. They didn't need laws to enforce them to give their customers refunds in, in cases where the customers wanted it. So That's an excellent point, uh, Mubi. Thank you. So we were talking about the, the steps that a less... Let's all must take. Uh, sorry, we have another call on the line. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah, um, I'd like to know, um, you know, at the time, my husband and myself, we bought a house. And I was a, a co-signer. I worked at the time, right? So eventually, um, the bank, the society that provided the loan, they closed down and we were handed over to another financial institute. Was it a result that the, the house is actually just on my husband's name, his initial, right? Now what I'd like to know is when I actually go to the bank and inquire or ask for a balance, they wouldn't give it to me. And I asked them about it and then they said because um, the, the house is on his name only. They can't give it to me. But, um, you know, a time, a while back, we received a summons. And they summons both of us. I mean, I'm responsible to pay, but I, I, won't, I can't get, um, like, a balance or something. So what, what right? How do I go about it? What can I do? I think if okay. I... Thank you for your question. I think if I understand the caller correctly, 
the house itself is registered on the name of your husband, but the loan or the bond uh, in terms of which the house was purchased is in the name of both yourself and your husband. Um, if I'm correct, I find that very strange because both parties who are purchasers or co-purchasers in terms of any bond given by any bank have to co-own the property as well. Um, that's one of the means of security that the bank would require before granting a bond. Um, also, I, I think the scenario was the, the initial loan was with the building society, which migrated over, it closed down, it migrated over to the bank. The bank sees one party only on their, on their account details, but in fact there are two owners because if she's getting a summons, then it's, it's in both their names. So perhaps the bank ought to be approached in a very firm manner, go and see the bank manager and say, look, I want you to rectify your accounts because I am responsible for this, but you're telling me I can't, I'm not able to find out what the balance is. So he has to rectify his accounts. In fact, in terms of FICA, the bank has a responsibility to properly identify all of its customers and its clients, their IDs, their residential address. So you have the right to go back to the bank and say, look, I don't think you're complying with your FICA obligations. Absolutely, I think you're quite right. Uh, we have another call online. Yes, good day. Good day. I, I just want to find out. Um, I've just been dismissed now. But the problem is, um, I had a driver. I was a branch manager at the company. And um, the, we, were, the, uh, we were low at staff. And uh, the, the driver... And only a learner's driver. But we ask the driver or the guy, is it possible, can he just went and um, pick up something else in it? But now they just missed me. So what can I do? Because I went in TSMA now, and my case is on 11th of uh, April, like um, March. Marvin? Sure. <clears throat> um, Depending on whether or not the employer followed the procedural requirements as set out in the Labor Relations Act for your dismissal, as well as whether or not they satisfy these substantive uh, fairness requirements as set out in the Act, the CCMA will make a finding either in your favor or in favor of your employer. And uh, I think that you should just uh, go the CCMA route as you currently have and wait for the, be for the best outcome. So what you're saying is lead the evidence, the best evidence that you have to support your case at the CCMA. Absolutely. and Especially where the learner driver, surely he can't operate a, a truck or a vehicle without a driver, a licensed driver. Ex exactly. If a learner driver didn't comply with the requirements for operating a vehicle on a national or public road, um, that is one of the substantive requirements for the fairness of your dismissal. But it goes about further and above that. Um, the procedural requirements, were you given a notice? Were you given a warning? Were you given a, an opportunity? Were you called into a disciplinary inquiry? Were you given the opportunity to have your side of the story heard? Uh, those things count for a lot at the CCMA. As a matter of fact, those things are actually crucial. Including the charge sheet in writing and an opportunity to he attend the hearing. And Absolutely. So thank you for your call. Mubin, we, just to move on now, we, you know, I know we, we keep on coming back to a very interesting topic of what steps must the lessor follow in order to find a proper application in terms of PI? You said there's a two-step process. Yes. Uh, sorry, before you answer, I think we've got another caller. This is an open line, so Great. go ahead. Hi there. Um, are you talking about legal evictions? Okay, now I have a structure on my property. It was supposed to be a pool shed. Okay, so now we've got a couple living in there and they extended it a bit, but now I I would like to replace the Bible Creek around the property. And this structure is attached to the Bible Creek. And I would like to have it moved and I'm not planning on putting up another structure on the property. So how do I go about 
having these people leave or move, and if, if they if they're unwilling. To. Thank you for that, Mobin. Well, uh, is there a lease in place, and if so, what are the terms and conditions? If there is no lease in place, that a reasonable and fair notice to the couple living in your tool shed will suffice for purposes of them n not having a valid ground for being in occupation any longer. Once you reach that point, you then have to make the application to serve a notice in terms of Section 4.2. Um, th that application must be served on the tenants as well as the local municipality in which you reside. Um, if you get the order granted in your favor, you then are allowed to serve the formal application, the formal eviction application in terms of the PI Act. Once they are in receipt of the formal eviction application, they have the opportunity to respond to it or to dispute it or anything of that sort. I think just to clarify, your first question was, does, is there a valid lease agreement? Now, a lease agreement doesn't have to be in writing to be valid. That's correct. You can enter into an oral lease agreement. Absolutely. And even if you had a lease agreement and it terminated on a certain date and nothing else happened after that, you can't say there is no valid lease agreement. In fact, the lease agreement is then governed by the common law, which is that each party could give the other one month's notice of termination. That's right. I hope that uh, assists you. So, Mubin, just to continue unpacking um, the, the, the question of the obligations, and I've heard you say this a few times, I think you need to just uh, make the viewers understand the two-step process because we're talking about the 4-2 and then the actual application. That's right. Well, the first, the first application is actually an ex parte application, which actually means that the notice of that application need not be given to the, the um, tenant um, uh, the purpose of this application is uh, to f the court to allow you to take eviction steps. N if this ap application is successful, you are then in a position to go ahead and serve and file a formal eviction application, setting out the grounds on which you are bringing the application. Um, in your founding affidavit, you will, you will state, for example, the date on which the tenant took occupation, the date on which the lease agreement had become lapsed or expired, the date on which notice of this had been served, um, the reasons why the tenant is now in unlawful occupation or has no ground, for example, no valid lease or anything, any other ground to remain in occupation of the premises. Um, once all of this is set out and filed in a proper eviction application, it must be served on the tenant as well as the local municipality in which the uh, property is situated. The tenant has, uh, uh, upon receipt, has the right to approach their attorney for legal advice if they dispute anything that's contained in the founding affidavit or likewise. And uh, not too long after that, the matter will then eventually be heard at court and a proper ruling or finding will be made either by a judge or a magistrate depending on where jurisdiction is founded. Okay. Just pause on that. We have another call online. Hello, go ahead. Hello, yes. Uh, I just want to know what can I do. I, I bought a car on an auction. And I paid uh, the auction, yes, the money cash. And the owner of the vehicle, when I uh, went to go register the vehicle at the department, uh, they told me that uh, the vehicle is now duplicated onto the owner's name. Now I can't get a vehicle onto my name. What what can I do? Okay. Well, this is a very simple matter. What you need to do is approach the license department, ask them for reasons in writing as to why the vehicle cannot be put into your name. Um, if they claim that it is duplicated, you need to ascertain from the original owner um, or you could you could actually make an application to court and say, look, I bought this vehicle. Here's the original owner's confirmatory affidavit. This is my vehicle. I use my proof of payment and whatever else it may be. I need to get this vehicle into my name for obvious reasons, and that is actually a very simple thing to resolve. So, can I go to the police station and open a case? I wouldn't advise you to go and open a case at a police station. It doesn't sound like a criminal matter to me. It sounds more like a civil 
sort of matter. Um, it, it, it happens very often with our license department where uh, papers uh, are mixed up and ownership is duplicated from person to person of any specific vehicle. It is, it is actually a, 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 department, a departmental issue and uh, it actually can be resolved by you persisting and uh, dealing directly with the license department. They'll ask you for all sorts of documentation, for example, your contract that you purchased the vehicle, proof of payment, uh, that sort of thing. If you can, you can even get an affidavit signed by the seller stating that he sold this vehicle to you and it should be transferred into your name. But he refused to do that because I went many times to the department and nothing is happening. If, if the original, uh, if the seller is refusing to assist you to get the vehicle into your name, even though you've paid him for it, then you have a civil claim against the seller because not only did he sell you the car, he also sold you ownership to the car, which is which is your your your, your real right um, in law. So you would have a claim against him in a civil court, um, but I don't see how it would go to a criminal court. So I, I wouldn't advise you to. Uh, pursue the matter at a police station. I would advise you to consult with an attorney and take the matter up in a civil court. Oh, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mubin, uh, sorry, just to come back to the, the obligations of the lessor. So you were saying he then he, he serves the first one and then he, he go, goes back to court and say, look, I've served it. I've served this document in terms of section 4.2 on them. 14 days have passed. I've served on the city council. Um, I'm now giving them another notice. Give me a date, and then there'll be a hearing, and there'll be a finding. That's pretty much the long and the short of it. That is the procedure that will be followed by the landlord. And like I said, the lessee is also entitled to dispute it if there's anything contained in the founding affidavit set out in, by the landlord. Um, now, one of the allegations is that the lessee has to be in default for six months or more. I mean, lots of lessors find that horrifying that the, the tenant is staying there, he hasn't paid, he doesn't want to pay, he doesn't want to move, and he's there for six months. The six-month requirement actually is, is limited in application. It only applies to cases where the tenant is uh, very elderly or, or uh, for example, a single mother with children to look after and that sort of thing. So, so it's, it's not a blanket uh, fitting, it's, it's, uh, it depends on circumstances. Yes. We have another call on the line. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, brother, I have a motor accident related inquiry. Uh, yes. My stationary vehicle was uh, hit by uh, one of two vehicles involved in the collision. Now, do I have a right to claim from the owner of the vehicle that hit me? Yes, absolutely. Uh, how do I go about doing that? Well, you have to get a quotation for the cost of repairing your vehicle. Preferably, yes. I'd advise you to get three alternate quotations and choose the lowest from the three. Um, you then have to send a letter of demand to the party responsible for the damages to your vehicle. If they don't, comply with the demand, you then issue a summons in the civil court for the damages that your vehicle suffered. I see. So it's the, if there were two vehicles involved in the collision, I got a claim from the one that hit me. That, that does complicate it a little bit because you need to claim from the one who is at fault. Um, oh. If, for example, two vehicles had an accident and your vehicle was stationary and suffered damages as a result of the accident between the other two vehicles. The person who is responsible for the accident between the other two vehicles is the person you should seek your compensation from. But if you don't know, you sue both. Absolutely. Uh, but what's very helpful is the police plan and accident report if there was one drawn on the scene to see what, yes, the, police, uh, what, what the police said. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, they, they said I must come and collect the report within the day or two. And this accident happened yesterday, so I'm going to go to the police station tomorrow. That's right. So once you have that, you'll be able to ascertain from the police plan and accident report, they would say vehicle A did this and vehicle B did this, so you will know who was, co who was responsible for that collision. Where it, there's uncertainty and you were in the right, you were stationary, then you sue both the parties. I see. Okay. Jazakallah. 
Okay, you're welcome. I mean, just to continue, we're nearly at the end of the show. Just to continue with the, the last bit about uh, winding up, I think perhaps we've done a lot with uh, uh, consumer protection and PI. Let's talk about company law. Again, it's something that uh, people face uh, every day in everyday life, aspects of company laws. Now, for example, uh, the company laws have gone through a number of changes. The most recent change was about two years ago and there's a substantive and significant changes, but some of the things that haven't changed. Uh, a director, sometimes he's confused with the shareholder. Yes. So yeah. Anglo-American has, say, a million shareholders. Yes. But they're not a million directors. So w what's the difference between shareholders and directors? A shareholder is a partial owner of a company. Or, well, is, is entitled to receive a dividend when a dividend is declared. A director, on the other hand, is a person who has a fiduciary duty towards the company and who is charged with the duty of running and uh, the affairs of the company. A director is a member of the board of directors. Um, you get a distinction between a, an executive director and a non-executive director. Um, so so your, your actual distinction between a director and a shareholder is very, very vast. Um, share, like I said, shareholders, they entitled to dividends when one, one is actually declared. So one is an employee and one is an owner, partial owner. The you shareholder is a partial owner, the director is an employee. Uh, we, have a la we have a last call on the line. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa salam. Salam. Uh, am I speaking to Ashraf? You're speaking to both of us. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So I'd like to know, um, my husband is South African and he works for a foreign company in Angola. Does South African law apply or does Angolan law apply? That will depend entirely on the contract itself. Where, where uh, there's multiple jurisdictions yes. uh, uh, and there's various laws that apply to this. For example, if the parties entered into the contract in South Africa and signed it here and completed it here, and yes. payment was meant to be taken in South Africa in rands or other currencies, yes. then yes. South African law will apply. Is that right, Mumi? That's absolutely correct. And in the other okay. scenario, if it's in Angola? Well, yes. if, if, if the contract stipulates that the employer is an Angolan-based company, then the Angolan labor laws would be applicable to any dispute between employee and employee. Unless okay. there's an arbitration clause, a clause that specifically says that when we in dispute, Neither South Africa nor Angola will apply because they, they, they can't trust the, the courts to be fair to the nationals or to foreign nationals, for example, that's theory. Then they would say, say the laws of, of a third country will apply, um, the laws of England or whatever. But all of those things, uh, the, the, the question or the answer that you want is in the contract itself. It will tell you which laws apply. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I mean, just to, we just to finalize, you know, we have just like a, a, a minute or two uh, to wrap up. You, you, you know, you touched on a very, very important topic, and that is of company law in everyday transactions. Just, just to make that, um, you know, less uh, complicated, what, what does it really mean if I'm a shareholder? What are my rights? As a shareholder, you have many rights. Um, like I said, the directors of a company have a fiduciary duty towards the company. A fiduciary duty means that they must act in the best interest of the company at all times. As a shareholder, if you find a director not complying with his fiduciary duty in any way whatsoever, you are entitled to approach the courts for relief against such a director. So an example of a fiduciary duty is I as a director, I know of a particular piece of land, I go and buy the land, in a company's name, then I pretend to be selling that land back to the company at a higher profit. So I'm basically competing with my own employer. So I'll be in breach of my fiduciary duty to the company itself. That's an example. Uh, ab absolutely. And that's a very good example because not only will you be competing with your employer and breaching your, uh, your fiduciary duty in that manner, you'll also be declaring uh, or deriving an, a benefit, a profit from selling a piece of land to your own company. Uh, right. So that, that is also a breach of fiduciary duty. So, so basically, you know, uh, we, you know, we try to cover a very, very complex topic. I mean, it looked very easy, uh, commercial transaction in everyday matters, but it's a very deep uh, topic. And uh, 
I thank you for having come on, and I remind the, the viewers to take Bobin's advice. Please approach your attorney with your necessary questions. Get the right kind of help, and you'll never go wrong. Thank you for having joined us here. Thank you, Mubid, for having joined us and given us of your time. Thank you for having me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.